The title of this lecture is Indian II, Hopi Jurisdiction Beyond the Mesas, and I like this picture. It actually, I like it not just because I took it, though I did take it. Um, it's a road on the Hopi Reservation that leads off the Hopi Reservation, and that is the actual sign. Roads that are on Indian reservations are actually maintained, paid for, and supported either by the tribe themselves or by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And this road is maintained by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is the US government office responsible for working with Indian tribes, uh, tribal nations. And the official designation of any road maintained by the federal office, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, is, um, everyone thinks I'm, I'm not nearly as tall as I am. This is a rare thing for me. Um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, all the roads operated by the Bureau of Indian Affairs are known as Indian roads. And it just so happens that the Indian road on the Hopi Reservation leading off is called Indian Road 2. And I like it because of the double meaning of two. That is, this is also Indian. And it is suggestive of what the topic is for this talk, which is if the last talk we talked a lot about um, the articulation of norms, knowledge, and authority on the Hopi Indian Reservation and between Hopi tribal members today, we're going to talk about how those things operate off of the Hopi Reservation in various contexts. So the outline of this lecture. <clears throat> I'll give you a bit of an introduction, and then I'll get into what I'm calling Hopi tradition as jurisdiction, and the uh, dash in the middle is on purpose, which I'll get into. Then we'll get into some consultations of the sort that I've shown you before with the Cultural Preservation Office. And finally, I'll talk about and sum up with some concluding thoughts and some further directions. First, introduction. This lecture is an ethnographic study of meetings of the Hopi Tribal Government Office that consults with federal agencies and institutions uh, who hold Hopi cultural property, that is Hopi material culture and immaterial culture, not currently in the hands of the Hopi tribal nation. The office that is responsible for this is one I have uh, introduced to you before. This is the office of Hopi, the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office, or HCPO. My argument for this talk will be that what the HCPO is doing particularly in light of new, uh, rather recent though, um, but actually about 25 years old now, um, protocols and regulations from the federal government around the management of cultural property, of Native American cultural property. The HCPO office works in consultations uh, of, with uh, agencies and institutions to extend Hopi traditional norms and practices to the people and places in possession of Hopi cultural properties, even when they're not Hopi, or not historically considered themselves to be Hopi. And I will say that in this work, sometimes the uh, HCPO and its officers fail, and I'll show you some failures, and sometimes they succeed, and I'll try to point to what may be some possible successes. I will show that the CPO fails, the HCPO fails, when non-Hopi actors see Hopi culture and continue to see Hopi culture either as material objects of science or somehow of, as vehicles of cultural meaning, but not as both at the same time. And it's in seeing them as one and whole together, inseparably, that we get to understand what are the conditions of success and what are the circumstances under which Hopi, uh, uh, Hopi cultural preservation officers feel like they're doing a satisfactory job. I will show you how they failed with some interactions with the US Forest Service. And I'll show you that they succeed when culture is seen as both material objects and ethical commitments, things and practices, creating relations in their co-maintenance or the opportunity for relationships between the non-Hopi institutions that hold their material culture and the Hopi tribe itself. And I will suggest ways in which I think 
the HCPO is succeeding in this process, in this effort, with the Field Museum at Chicago. Now, from last week, I spent the better part of the uh, lecture talking about what I've called Hopi epistemological limits. And I talked about the various ways in which the limits of who can know what and how not only work out between non-Hopis and Hopis, but between and among Hopis themselves. And I used a concept of knowledge that comes out of classic analytic philosophy, actually comes from Kant and subsequent thinkers, as a so-called justified true belief. We talked a little bit about why knowledge isn't just a true belief, but in fact is a justified true belief. And the implications of that, I have argued, is that they imply a recognition and an assessment of the authority of a statement or a claim that something is true or something is the way it is, and that that assessment or claim involves a certain kind of social relationship. That is, knowledge itself is both an expression of authority, but as such is one that requires a kind of audience to recognize it as such and to involve each other uh, collaboratively, even if it's an antagonistic collaboration, in some kind of uh, recognition relationship. So I've said then also, if that's what knowledge is, then also limits to knowledge entail a kind, at least for Hopi, a kind of authority, that is access and its limits are performances of authority, and uh, relationships of recognition, an invitation to an ongoing relationship, and we talked a little bit about what that means specifically in the Hopi context. And then I brought you this quote from a Hopi historian named Lomayomtiwa Ishi, who wrote in, this was his dissertation, he wrote, there is a long recognition that a total understanding of the entire Hopi scheme of things is never attainable among the Hopi. That is, Hopi themselves see this as unattainable. In one sense, this lack of centralized knowledge, this lack of an ability to know the whole story, ensures that different clans and societies must carry their weight in order for Hopi life to exist. And then I also offered you this other quote, which I think is, when understood properly, uh, under part and parcel of how authority is generated through limits of knowledge out at Hopi, that for Hopi, political authority, social authority, and the expression of right relations emerges through a strange kind of relationship between uh, cooperation but not a surrendering of one's individual capacities to act on their own behalf or act on their own intentions. And that's hard for us to get our heads around, but it is instrumental from everything from how Hopi people think of themselves, how Hopi song writers think of themselves as collaboratively producing songs, traditional songs for the purposes of kachina ceremonies and the like, to how um, Hopi social life is organized and ordered in the ceremonial process, to how actually villages, Hopi villages, work to this day. I'm going to suggest that this idea of cooperation without surrender is precisely what Hopi, uh, the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office is after in its work uh, with and uh, uh, through the lens of uh, repatriation and other kinds of consultations with non-native institutions holding their Hopi, their cultural property. And I want to argue with a tip and a recognition to the uh, authoritative dimensions of this, the socio-political but also epistemological authority, that we can think of this as a kind of jurisdiction. Now, I go back to my roots in law for this notion, but I will unpack exactly what I mean by that, and specifically why I think there is not just a, how will I say, uh, a metaphysical dimension to this claim to knowing, and its authority, but in fact certain spatial, material, and territorial kinds of dimensions that uh, emerge in a mutual obligation to place and space in a particular way. So a little bit more about that, Hopi tradition as jurisdiction. Here's a definition from Black's Law Dictionary, which is 
generally considered the authoritative dictionary on, on legal terms in the Anglo-American and, uh, uh, and Anglo um, uh, legal systems. Jurisdiction is, and this should be familiar, the power of the court to decide a matter in controversy, which presupposes the existence of a constituted court with control over the subject matter and the parties in that controversy. So notice an element of uh, there being a kind of power, and also not just a power, but an authority to decide matters. Notice also that, as I said before, there is a, uh, a scope of this exercise of power um, that is involved in the definition of jurisdiction, uh, a territorial scope that is over a certain area of land or a certain territory, uh, subject matter, certain types of, of issues, contracts, criminal law, um, disputes among, uh, over inheritance, are within the domain or jurisdiction of a particular kind of court. And finally, the kind of person, a citizen or a non-citizen, who has rights before this court to be heard. And we can think of this concept in a bunch of different ways. In the Anglo legal traditions, uh, in the, the common law tradition, you in fact had, in medieval England, you had a series of different courts, each with separate jurisdictions. So you had the king's court, you had also maritime courts, courts that dealt with issues relating to the seas. You also had canonical courts, uh, courts of the church, ecclesiastical courts. And sometimes the different jurisdictions of these courts would actually butt up against each other. So in fact, someone could uh, claim to escape the king's justice if they were caught doing some sort of crime that the king deemed was a violation of uh, his law. Um, someone could, and regularly did, run to the church and claim uh, um, uh, refuge there under the rules of ecclesiastical law, claiming that, in essence, this court was persecuting them because of a religious belief, not because they violated some law. And because of that, you had a, com a competing kind of jurisdiction, and this individual, who might be a king subject in the common law court, could identify himself in another way as a member of the church and therefore a different type of person who had different types of rights and announced and enacted the kinds of jurisdiction of this other uh, tribunal. Finally, and this is important, the notion of jurisdiction itself entails, at least in the English language, uh, a kind of um, presumption that uh, the institution that is, whose jurisdiction is being announced or described has, already has the authority to adjudicate that matter. So we can talk about the court's jurisdiction as a thing that always already exists on some level. And I'll get into why that's important in a second. Because the way I want to use the notion of jurisdiction is slightly different. I want to use the notion as it arises from its etymological dimensions and as it's been taken up more recently by certain critical legal scholars. In particular, I want to think of jurisdiction as a kind of legal speech, juris dictio, one that not only performs the authority it enacts, but also presupposes that authority. That is, in the very enacting of it, of expressing a kind of jurisdiction that this institution has, it presupposes that institution always already had that authority. So this comes, as I say, from the Latin juris dictio, which actually is a double genitive. It means law's speech and the law speaking both at the same time. It's an enactment but also a description of that which is being enacted. And that is important for understanding how jurisdiction works. Let me give you an example. If you were to walk into a court in the US, um, let's say you had a contract dispute, or let's say you were pulled into court over a contract dispute, if you wanted to challenge the jurisdiction of that court, if you wanted to say, I have no reason to be here, right? This court has no authority over me. The only way you could do that is if the court 
decided that it didn't have jurisdiction over you. So even when the court enacts the lack of its jurisdiction, even in the instance when it says, you're right, we have no jurisdiction, goodbye, you have, by going into the court, in fact, authorized it to speak authoritatively. So even when the court denies that it has authority over your specific case, it does so in a way that enacts its power to make such decisions in the first place. Do we see that? And that is why this notion of jurisdiction is interesting because it performs the very authority of the court at the very instance that even in certain circumstances it might say it doesn't have authority over this specific case. And so you can never go into a court in the US, for example, and just legibly challenge the very existence or the raison d'etre of the court. You can't go in and say, this court is baloney because blah, 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 or because I believe in a higher God and my only judge is the, 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 the almighty being. The court, you would not be legible to the court. You would not be able to be seen or authorized in any way. The court would, not be, would be authorized not to pay attention to that and to make its assessment based on however it determined whether it had jurisdiction. So the concept of jurisdiction is interesting because it makes legal authority, first of all, the power of law to speak and to act, the real effect of mundane, quotidian, everyday practices. Every court must decide upon its, on its jurisdiction in the first instance, and at any point in time, at least in the Anglo-American tradition, you can at any time in the, peri in, the, in the process of a case challenge the court's jurisdiction. You can stop the proceedings as they go and they say, you know what, I've been arguing all along that this, is, that this case is wrong. Now I'm going to change my argument. You have no jurisdiction over me. And immediately the court has to establish its jurisdiction. And so it's establishing that it has authority. It's enacting its authority in the very details of that everyday interaction of the courtroom process. And in so doing, in so demanding that you, that it, in so being able to enact that authority in that very instance, it doesn't have to answer the more difficult question of, well, where do you get your authority from, court? It only has to decide whether it has authority over this case or not. It doesn't have to uh, decide global uh, metaphysical questions about the nature of authority and its legal authority in general. And so those grand questions about sovereignty that Carl Schmitt and others, uh, Giorgio Agamben, have invoked, in fact, come immediately off the table when we talk about questions of jurisdiction, which have to do immediately and instantaneously with the quotidian, mundane application of the law to you. And the court is what does this. The court effectuates its quotidian, everyday activity, and in so doing, erases the possibility that you can even challenge its authority more uh, existentially, as it were. And this is why someone like Kostas Duzinas, another critical law scholar, basically says this, that the very function of jurisdiction is to bring the sovereign to life, to give him voice, and then to conceal that sovereignty by confounding its creative, performative aspect with the declaration of the law. Well, what does that mean? That means the speaking of the law totally hides the fact that it's performing this enactment of legal authority in the first place. And just sort of says, well, we have this authority. It comes from somewhere else. It comes from before. It comes from the Constitution. It comes from the people, wherever. But we don't have to ask those kinds of questions because all we're deciding is whether or not the law applies to you. And because of that, we can make that decision. And even if we decide the law does not apply to you, we still can live to fight another day as, authoritative, as an authoritative institution. Do you understand that? So this is the power of a notion of juris dictio, law speech speaking the law. Now, what I want to argue is that the HCPO, this office that deals with and consults with non-native institutions that hold Hopi cultural property, that they are working in a way to extend Hopi juris dictio, uh, 
a speaking of hopey normative authority outside, long past, far away from the 12 mesas or three mesas that make up uh, the Hopi reservation today. And that we can see how that expression of Hopi normative authority, traditional authority, is being articulated in the mundane practices of these federal consultations. That is, they are enacting and performing Hopi traditional norms while at the same time presupposing that those norms have always already existed, that they are the authoritative ones to enact that, that, that expression of Hopi traditional authority, and that they expect and hope that there will be a willing, recognizing audience to receive that and recognize that authority on the other end. In fact, we have to recall this idea of cooperation without surrender. That is, if we see HCPO engage in these consultations in a way that feel like it is a power grab or feel like it's them telling you to shut up and go away, give us our stuff back, you'll completely miss the point. And that is that the point has always been for Hopi, and I'll attempt to show this, that a recognition of their authority is what is being sought, an acknowledgment and a relationship of recognition of their authority, and the opportunity to pursue a relationship of cooperation without surrender. That's what I'm going to suggest is in the offing here. Now here's my data. Uh, I spent, and, ha and I'm continuing to spend, and so far about 15 aggregate months of field work. I've been studying and working with the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office on and off for the last four or five years. Uh, I have been observing their interactions with different um, uh, uh, federal agencies and institutions that maybe are not federal agencies but receive federal money, uh, including the Field Museum, including the Forest Service and others. Uh, I've collected about 88 hours of audio recorded interaction data. Um, I've also done a 34 interviews, 34 hours of interview and about, with about 23 different subjects and a whole bunch of files from their archives. Um, and from a bunch of different archives, the CPO's own archives, the National Archives, the Museum Archives, and also University Archives uh, at my home institution, University of Chicago, but also uh, Northern Arizona University. Now, you will recall in the last talk, I described a bit about the way in which the details of everyday interaction in Hopi court produces a certain kind of Hopi jurisprudence. I suggested that in those contexts, you can see Hopi people coming to court, arguing in their own language, and tr attempting to navigate the vicissitudes of, of a Hopi language of law with, and its traditional discourses, and the ways in which you have to speak it, right? With the uh, demands of the Anglo-style law of the Hopi court itself, this is a tribal court, that has uh, an inheritance of certain kinds of colonial legal procedures that it uses, and that in the interface you have produced something like this emergent Hopi tribal juris, uh, jurisprudence, a jurisdictio or a speaking of the law that is unfolding and continuing to unfold as we speak to this day. Now I'm going to argue that essentially the same thing is happening here and that we can see this interface, this friction between the norms, discourses, practices uh, of Hopi traditional discourse and the federal consultation requirements and the rules and procedures about those requirements unfolding together to create this kind of jurisdiction beyond the mesas, okay? So that's what I'm going to invite you to, 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 to consider along with me. Okay, here are some consult. Well, before we get into the consultations themselves, I want to give you a little background. Where do these consultations emerge from? Where does this right to engage with the federal agencies and institutions that uh, get federal money come from? Well, first of all, we have to understand who tribal nations are in the US. Uh, under US law, they are acknowledged as domestic dependent nations 
what the heck is a domestic dependent nation? It sounds like an oxymoron to begin and to end with. In fact, it is, <laughs> and it is something that is constantly being worked out. Uh, it is a kind of a internal sovereign, considered to be nonetheless in a state of pupillage, whose relations to the United States resemble that of a ward to their guardian. Now, if that doesn't confuse you, I don't know what will. Uh, it is deeply confusing, and yet it is the law of the land and remains the law of the land. This was announced uh, a long time ago, 1831, by Chief Justice John Marshall, generally considered the greatest Chief Justice of the, of the US system ever. And uh, this was one of three cases generally referred to as the Cherokee Trilogy, which today still dictate the general outlines of the government-to-government -government relationship that tribes have to the US government. In fact, in the US, tribes are a third semi-sovereign. And we've talked a little bit about what this means. But here it is, domestic dependent nations. A government-to-government -government relationship, but also one that the federal government owes a kind of trust responsibility to. Now, that means that, at least in the abstract, the federal government must act in a way that is beneficial for tribes and must always act when a policy issue emerges related to tribes. It must always act as if it's acting in their best interest as a ward or as a guardian to its ward. Now, have they always? Obviously not. In fact, have they ever? Much less often than they've acted uh, aggressively. Um, but they've always done so with the eye that what they're doing is acting for the benefit of tribes. So even when they were assimilating tribal peoples, even when they were assimilating and taking away their lands, they were saying they were acting in the best interest of tribal nations, uh, uh, getting them to accommodate to uh, Euro-American ways of being and getting them to learn how to become yeoman farmers. Even when they were doing things like chopping up their land and giving away half of it. The idea was they didn't need all that land and to have white uh, farmers sit uh, next to them would benefit them by uh, example. So all of the actions that have ever been taken by the federal government vis-a-vis -vis tribes has always been acted, enacted within the ambit of this idea of a trust responsibility. Part and parcel with that is the recognition that the federal government at the end of the day has what's called plenary power. Plenary power is extra constitutional authority that the US Congress has to do whatever it wants to tribes, so long as it does it explicitly and without review by the Supreme Court. Now, that doesn't mean that they've always done that, but that's the general idea. Today, there are 566 federally recognized tribal nations in the US today. It's a lot more than people give credit to or realize. Uh, and uh, very often, if you find yourself in the West, you will find yourself in the US West, you'll find yourself within pretty close proximity of some tribal land or, an or another. And if uh, you're with a tribe that has a tribal court, you will find yourself in the jurisdiction, or even not, you'll find yourself in the jurisdiction of a tribal nation and could find yourself liable to tribal law. Starting in the 1960s, there was uh, a policy shift uh, in the US government that largely emerged out of some big conferences that were held actually at the University of Chicago um, around the fate of native peoples in the US. It was called the, American Indian, the Chicago American Indian Conference of 1961. And uh, it produced a document called the um, uh, Declaration of Indian Purpose. And in that statement, in which I think something, which before this time, tribes had never gathered at this amount and this level before for a week long of conversations, sometimes with senators, mostly with academics, and mostly with each other, uh, describing what it is that they wanted, thinking about what it is they wanted from the federal government. And they issued this Declaration of, in, of, of Indian Purpose, and in essence it said, we want self-determination. We want the right to decide for ourselves how our lives will be led. 
And at first, it, was, it fell upon deaf ears. In fact, the per policy period just prior to this was the period that's generally been referred to as the termination period, because the idea was after Native Americans, especially those who served in World War II, came back, it was in their best interest to relocate them to, Indi to uh, urban centers and generally to do away with the federal trust responsibility. And so certain states, uh, in collaboration with the federal government, started uh, agreeing to take over jurisdiction over tribal lands and to do away with the federal trust responsibility uh, to what was generally considered absolute um, disaster. And certain states, like California um, and certain parts of Minnesota, still have aspects of what's called Public Law 280, the termination era law, uh, and, um, and this still is an issue for various reasons. But nonetheless, Indian Self-Determination and the Education Assistance Act of 1975 was designed to address and, and, and repeal the termination period policies. And from there, moving forward for the next 25, 30 years, and really up until the present, you have what's generally referred to among scholars of Indian law, federal Indian law, this era of self-determination. And virtually every one of the acts that I point, that I list here between 1975 and 1990, um, aside from the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, express in one way or another an appreciation for and uh, a recognition of the right of Indian tribes, tribal nations, to protect their own cultural property and to preserve it, to enhance it, and to work with uh, federal funding in various ways to um, preserve it and promote it. Um, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act did another kind of self-determination. It, it recognized the authority of tribes to, to gamble or to hold, have casinos, which has been an absolute boon for tribe, most tribes, not all, um, um, to, economic, to provide untold economic uh, benefits, though not without problems attached to that as well. I want to focus on the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA, as it's referred to. NAGPRA was the law that was put in place in 1990 out of recognition that many of the museums and universities in the US that were receiving federal money had enormous, enormous collections of Native American human remains that were going, uh, that were basically rotting in the bottoms of their, of their uh, basements. And uh, this was an act designed to address this problem, what was consider considered an egregious um, violation of various kinds of rights and recognition. And what was effective was that tribes worked not just to deal with human remains, but with all associated funerary objects uh, important um, uh, religious objects, sacred objects, and other cultural materials that they could identify as part of their, uh, that they, which, with which they have cultural affiliation. And so the law was passed in 1990, and the important parts here I quote, federal agencies and institutions receiving federal funding and in possession of Native American cultural items are required to inventory said items, and within six months, of completion, notify those Native American tribes or lineal descendants who can claim cultural affiliation and if requested to expeditiously return such cultural items. Unless, and this is a big unless, unless such items are indispensable for completion of a specific scientific study, the outcome of which would be of major benefit to the United States. That caveat has been used, that last little bit has been used regularly and repeatedly by various institutions to halt the process of even going into inventorying or to otherwise stop the process of repatriation as a whole. However, with the passage of this law, importantly, a considerable, well, not an, I would say maybe not a huge amount, but some money was set aside by the federal government to pay institutions to start the process of inventorying what they have. Very often, many of these museums, some of these universities, didn't even know what they had before this. And so the very first step was just to identify what existed there and to provide money and funding for these institutions that are notoriously strapped for funds, 
notoriously finding it hard to get funding for such in-house kind of work, to start inventorying what they actually have in their collections. And it, remarked, it, it marked a dramatic shift in the general operating procedures of lots of different uh, uh, disciplines associated and working with native peoples and their cultures. So here you have uh, a Forest Service archaeologist who I had the opportunity to interview who basically said, in all honesty, before the passage of NAGPRA, we didn't even think, it didn't even cross our minds to even consult with tribes. It just wasn't part of everyday operations. We just went and dug it up, and if it was on forest land, we dug it up, we cataloged it, we put it away. Or we studied it and wrote papers about it. But the very idea that contemporary nations might have an interest in these materials, might have some relationship to them, never even thought we should consult with them about it. This is some statistics from NAGPRA's, from NAGPRA's own uh, annual report from 2015. Uh, from 2015, 1,000, uh, 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 by 2015, 1,025 institutions have listed over 3.5 million cultural items and inventoried them as relevant and, uh, and, and uh, covered by NAGPRA. 709 Native American entities, that means tribal nations uh, or clans or other individuals, have requested 238,000 plus items for repatriation. They've made the request, which means they filed a form and started the process. And $43 million have been set aside by, uh, in, in federal grants, have been distributed to 871 institutions for this process. What I can tell you is I don't know how many uh, repatriations, successful repatriations have been made. What I can tell you is that in my work with the Hopi tribe, that um, they've done some, but by no means uh, have they done um, uh, major amounts of repatriation of materials. And the vast majority of the collections, and they have a lot, that are at the Field Museum, for example, remain at the Field Museum. And, in, and, and very often, they initiate these consultation processes and have not actually made a formal request. Now, the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office is not the only office of historical preservation or cultural preservation from, uh, 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 among the 566 tribes out there. In fact, there are quite a few. And most of them operate pursuant to this act, the Historic Preservation Act of 1966. A tribe may assume any or all part of the functions of a state historic preservation officer, and such responsibilities may be modified for tribal programs through regulations issued by the secretary. And the reason why they use the state historic preservation office uh, model is because very often what is happening when tribes are engaging with these materials, if they are not in museums, is that they are pursuing archaeological sites where questions of historical preservation mobilize whether or not uh, federal funds can be used or deployed to help preserve or protect these, inst these places. There are 158 tribal historic preservation offices today. And these are the groups who determine site eligibility, that is the eligibility of archaeological sites in particular for uh, the National Register, which is what's necessary in order to justify certain kinds of protections uh, of tribal materials in situ when they're not occurring on the reservation. That's critical. This is the web page from the National Association of the Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, and I just want to say and point out to you the three uh, uh, principles that they announce. One, sovereignty, this idea that what they are doing is enacting the sovereign authority of these tribal nations to act as governments co concerned with the interests of their communities. Number two, confidentiality, that is they want to be able to preserve the right to do this without um, demanding or without requiring that they make any of this public. And finally, they will go wherever the stuff is. That is, no boundaries. They will not just be content to pursue these interests on the reservation, 
They will not be content to just preserve the materials that happen to be on the artificially created reservations where, and the boundaries of those, but they will pursue it in forest lands, they will pursue them in museums, they will pursue them in universities, wherever they are. And so we have an impetus recognized explicitly by these offices that the pursuit of sovereign interests takes them off of native lands and out of native territory. The Hopi Cultural Preservation Office itself, I think I've shown this to you before, was created in 1994 by Hopi uh, tribal law. It was given the authority to participate uh, in decision-making processes that acknowledge the processes of decision-making from Hopi tradition itself, okay? The Hopi Tribal Council is not a traditional body of authority out at Hopi, and yet it recognizes the traditional uh, authority as a source of law but also acknowledges that NAGPRA itself creates a system for engagement and consultation around issues of cultural concern with non-Hopi uh, uh, colleagues. And so the uh, uh, Tribal uh, Council authorized the CPO to exercise administrative responsibilities and to really be the office who will enter into agreements pursue negotiations, complete consultations for the repatriation of sacred objects, objects of cultural patrimony, and various other cultural artifacts and human remains which were taken from the Hopi Reservation or collected from the Hopi Reservation. So this is it. This is the office that leads the charge. And not only does it lead the charge for Hopi, it leads the charge generally. Um, another archaeologist I interviewed, not the same guy, uh, said that really HCPO is kind of a leader, that uh, they have created protocols and instituted different kinds of operations that really uh, don't have a match. And in fact, others have taken them on and used them uh, to model their own practices. Um, so for example, even the Arizona State Historic Preservation Office uses the memorandum of, of understanding, the MOU of the CPO, as a template for all other tribal historic preservation offices uh, that it engages with, and even uh, Native nations in, elsewhere in the US, Canada, and Australia have used the CPO's research permit protocol, how people like me get to go do research out there, uh, for their own communities. So this CPO has uh, a fairly wide uh, recognition as a leader in the field. It has been uh, sort of in place even before the law authorized it. Lee Kuan Wasilma, who you've met before in these lectures, is the director. He has eight to 10 staff, including a legal researcher, an archeologist, an archivist, a coordinator of repatriation, and several contract archeologists. And most importantly, he will tell you, is this body of 18 or so elderly, elder Hopi men and sometimes women who he convenes for certain kinds of um, advisory uh, consultations, conversations. And this team is called the Cultural Resource Advisory Task Team. There's Lee, there's the offices of the Hopi Cultural Preservation, the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office right there on the Hopi Reservation. He says, Lee says that the CRAT team is by far the most important part of the CPO and involves individual elders who, are distinguished, who, have, who hold distinguished positions of authority in their traditional village social and ceremonial structure. They are individual men who represent each of the 12 villages and different members of each of the various clans within each village. And if you recall, we were talking about the radically decentralized quality of Hopi a traditional authority, and last week I told you a little bit about that. Well, it's back here again in the shape of this crack team. So here you have this familiar model, this traditional village schema. Each one of the smaller circles is, is uh, a, a schema, schematic representation of a clan, the bear clan, the water clan, the eagle clan, the tobacco clan, the sun clan. My, my names got a little messed up. And each one of those clans is understood 
as a essential part of the village as a whole. The village authority, this traditional authority, and before 1936, you didn't have anything like a Hopi tribal nation. You had 12 autonomous Hopi villages, which all happened to speak the same language, but didn't consider themselves as, as controlled by the others. Within that, you had individual clans, each of which played a certain role in the ceremonial cycle. Bear Clan had its knowledge. Bear Clan had its role to play. Bear Clan had its ceremonies that it had to perform. And in exchange for performing those, or Water Clan in exchange for performing those, every time, the same year, same day, they got to be part of the community. Cross-cutting these clans are various ritual societies who enact these ceremonies. And each clan is understood, and each society is understood as bearing their own knowledge, navoti, traditional knowledge, knowledge gained through hearing, which we talked a lot about last week. It's knowledge that cannot be distributed to anyone who is either not a member of the clan or is not a member of the ritual society in which that knowledge is transmitted. So this is radically decentralized knowledge. And it is knowledge, by the way, that is specifically instrumental and intended to enact the well-being of the community, largely by giving rain, but also by doing other sorts of powerful acts to control the natural forces, to bring forth fruitfulness and reproduction in the community. The Kikmongwi, the village leader, who's usually, just, who's usually the, the leader of the bear clan, all regularly is understood to have, uh, as a team of consultants, if you will, the other uh, ceremonial leaders, the other clan leaders, who will speak to him about their particular responsibilities and how those should be uh, exercised and executed. And as the ceremonial calendar unfolds, how each one un is understood to operate vis-a-vis -vis their own members. So clans are really the signal social unit at Hopi. And they're understood as being autonomous. In fact, someone, you have to marry someone from another clan, but if you ask that person if you know what your partner's clan's knowledge is, they will say, oh, we have no idea and we're not supposed to know. And yet they are obligated not just to their own clan members, but to the entire village. And each ceremony that is enacted is an expression of their obligations. And it is the enactment of the original village social contract again and again. And I would suggest that this is this model of jurisdiction that I'm trying to suggest, a model in which each clan is understood as autonomous, as having its own knowledge and authority, but which it must enact in order to operate it with co in cooperation, and with, but without surrender, to perpetuate the vitality of the entire village. This is the model anyway. It's not how it actually happens. It often happens in various ways that are uh, not nearly as neat or happy or kumbaya as that all sounds. Uh, but the fact of the matter is this is the ideal, typical model. And I would suggest that basically the Krat team who represent different clans and different villages essentially is performing the same responsibility in some related ways to uh, the HCPO and its leader to mirror and in fact to reenact because the materials require it, this traditional structure of authority and knowledge distribution. And as such, I would suggest that when the Krat team and when this leader, when the, the leader of the uh, HCPO goes to and meets with the uh, non-native institutions, in effect, they are trying to enact the same kind of relationship, cooperation without surrender. And in fact, treating this institution as an ancillary part of the larger sphere of Hopi social authority and power. So how does this work out? Well, you've seen these images before. I went on a, on a, on a field visit uh, to the Tonto National Forest, which is not on the Hopi Reservation, but south of it by about 130 miles, 160 miles. And we were looking at and asked, uh, I was working with the, the Cultural Preservation Office's CRAT team to consult on some sites 
Uh, and the sites were sites of archaeological significance that they were wondering that the Forest Service um, archaeologists wanted to excavate. And the reason they wanted to excavate these is because the land on which these sites were located was going to be sold. Or at least that was the plan, was they were going to sell these. And they wanted to know, would these sites be considered relevant or significant enough to be considered eligible for the uh, National Registry, and if so, of historic places, and if so, then they would get federal money to go and dig them up. So the HCPO archaeologist double checks. He says, so wait a minute. We're here to help you justify whether or not this is going to be uh, eligible sites for digging up. And he says, because that's not really what Hopi people want to do with such sites. What Hopi people want to do with such sites generally is to avoid them. But you're asking the Hopi tribal members to come down here, the Krat team to come here, and to verify that these are sites that are significant in a such a way that they would have some sort of relevance for digging up. And he says, uh, the Hopi archaeologist says one thing about a land swap. So in the past, maybe you've done traditional cultural property assessments, and avoidance would have been the recommendation. That's not an option here. And the archaeologist from the Forest Service says, that's right. The avoidance option went off the table pretty early. And he goes on to explain that the reason why they're evaluating the eligibility of these sites is for their data potential. That is, they want to know if, if there is data here that's worth salvaging, if they can gather as much data as we can, data that's going to tell us about who lived there, how long, and what they were doing. That is great, fantastic, scientific goals. This doesn't sit so well with the Hopi Krat team. And one says, so some of these sites that you're, that you're talking about, I guess you know, belonged to some of our ancestors, remember that we were passing through, who would it be up to? CPO, the Cultural Preservation Office, uh, the, Hope, the Hopi tribe, to say, you, you know, it's okay for you to go through it, that is to dig it up, or is it up to the Forest Service? And the archaeologist says, it's up to the Forest Service. And then he says to try to appease them, but okay, We'll consult and make sure that we've dealt with whatever issues the tribes have. Uh huh. But uh, legally, they're our responsibility and it's our decision as to what to do with it. This sort of what felt like a rather curt dismissal of any sort of interest that the tribe might have in this, other than digging it up, met with the following response. Well, we know that on Hopi, that there's a great migration. So there's numerous stories about where people came from, where they passed through, and that, you know, they're just places that Hopi has been to. And we, we all know that we were instructed when you go to leave your footprints, meaning that if you build your house there, you know, leave them there. If you put marks on the rock walls, you know, that's indicating that this clan or that clan comes through here. So it's many clans that pass through here. So. I'm sorry, this got a little messed up. It's kind of hard, he continues, to know that there's uh, no option for avoidance because the migration trails of our clans came th in through here and many other clans. There are ceremonies at Hopi that still recount the path to Hopi, and this is still very much alive. And these places that have been left, you know, people are still, we believe that people are still, spirits are still here. So we disturb that or somehow allow that to be disturbed. It's form of taboo, I guess. Living practice, living religion. So what the Krat team members were doing in that instance was reminding the archaeologists that there is a certain reason for avoidance here. To call them footprints, and, and one thing I would want uh, uh, to highlight your attention to, point your attention to, is the way in which they talked about this was not as if it was just our ancestors who moved through these places. It was we who left our footprints there. It was we who put our homes there. It was we who were taught if you have homes there, you leave them there and you don't disturb them. And that this is a living religion. 
From the perspective of the archaeologists, the value of these as scientifically significant was really not nearly as important from the Hopi perspective for their sacred sacral importance, for the fact that they continued to go there as a place to, to leave offerings, and in fact many did under this, on this occasion, and that they oriented these places as part of who they are today, not just who they once were or what they once did or even what their ancestors once were. Nonetheless, their protests, and, and, and so they expressed this in a very real way. They said the Hopi tribe considers, in a report back to, after this meeting, in a report back to the Forest Service, they said the Hopi tribe considers all sites in the project area to be ancestral sites and traditional cultural properties, and avoidance is recommended. That was their report. That was their consultation. That was what they suggested needed to be done. And the Forest Service ignored them. The Forest Service ignored it, in part because the question that they had, is there significance to these as sites of data collection, was met. The law, all it required was that this was a place of significance that had certain historical or research associated value of one form or another. So when the Hopi guys were asked, well, is this place significant? And they said, yes, that was what they needed. It doesn't quite meet the upshot of what the Hopi tribal members wanted or what this Krat team wanted, and yet it complied with the law. Suffice to say, the Hopi were upset about this. They felt that it was a failure to appreciate their interests. They felt that when they told them that these are our footprints, which is a, a transliteration of the Hopi, itakuku, our marks. Ita is the, is the we. Itakuku. That they ignored the temporal disjunct. They ignored the fact that they were including themselves as part of the peoples who walked through these areas. That it is part of their identity as a living, practicing religion. But I want to suggest that it's not enough simply to treat, uh, to, that while it was insufficient to treat this as data, as material objects of cultural significance that could tell you something about, about the past, it also wasn't enough, it would not be enough to simply treat this as religiously significant. And here's why. In a case that took place in a pla uh, very near, uh, around a site very nearby, uh, Novatukya Ovi, which is by many Hopi considered one of the most sacred sites. It's the home of the Katsinam, the, the ancestor spirits who come every year to bring rain and other good things, uh, return to the top of this mountain, which is the only mountain within uh, any relevant distance that has uh, year-round snow on top of it. And they have shrines, some of the most important shrines up on this site. And there was an effort by another part of the National Forest Service to authorize the creation of a ski resort on the top of it to pump uh, and to use um, reclaimed wastewater, right? So water from the neighboring city of Flagstaff treated, changed, you know, sanitized, and then shot up to make snow on this because while there's enough snow from a Hopi perspective, there wasn't enough snow for skiing. And the US Forest Service authorized this. Never mind that it literally was pissing on top of Hopi sacred land, a place where it is important because it brings rain, and they're putting wastewater on top of it. It pissed some Hopi people off, to say the least. They kept fighting, but, and they kept arguing that this place is absolutely central to their ceremonial system, absolutely central to who they are as a people, absolutely important and, and, and irreplaceable as their, and indispensable to their religion. And the federal courts said, sure, it's indispensable. And yes, it will, if affected in the way that is proposed to sp spray wastewater on top of it, a diminishment of, your sp of Hopi spiritual fulfillment. And yet, it doesn't constitute a substantial burden on their First Amendment rights to the free exercise of their religion. So simply calling this a religious commitment here was not enough to preserve Hopi interests. Just as much as it wasn't enough to call these things uh, relevant historical data, archaeological data, because it's also religious material, 
in the taunt, in the in the other one uh, other examples I just showed you. Here, it's not sufficient enough to show that it's religious. Not only that, despite the fact that this is precisely the fear, the same fear that this is a living religion that will die or will, is threatened when things like this kind of disruption are allowed. The destruction of these practices will also destroy our present way of life and culture. Those are not idle words. What I would suggest to you is that itakuku, these footprints for Hopi, are emerging irreducibly of the ethical, secular, moral, I'm sorry, not secular, sacred, moral dimensions of Hopi life with the material. This is a religion in a place. This is a way of life in a place. Itakuku not only mark the authoritative space, place, and power of Hopi life, they are a homeland more than just markers of where we are living, in the true sense of that meaning. And that in that sense, we can say Itakuku mark Hopi jurisdiction, where Hopi identity and normative authority are etched into the lands that hold them, and that there is no other place to be Hopi. In fact, Hopi people will tell you, at least initially. An HCPO, in consultation with the Forest Service, expected and hoped for a kind of partnership over the management of the cultural properties there, and they were met with something else. They wanted to exercise Hopi jurisdiction with decision-making power over the handling of those sites, and instead they were met with rejection, and that HCPO was attempting to argue with tradition in the same ways that people were arguing with tradition in Hopi court, but this time off of the reservation but the U.S. Forest Service failed to take it up. Now, I showed you this example, and I'm gonna to try to wind this up quickly because I've been talking a while. This is another kind of NAGPRA consultation, this one with the Hopi tribe, uh, Krat team, uh, to the Field Museum. And I showed you this image before, and I showed you this image of a prayer feather. And I suggested that because this prayer feather, which hangs next to the shrouded, uh, 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 shelves where Hopi material culture is downstairs in the basement of the field museum, that on the one hand, the field officials have agreed and assented to the treatment of Hopi material as sacred and secret, and have complied in their, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a serious, um, but in some ways small way, with the uh, uh, expectations and demands of Hopi that these things be handled discreetly and shrouded, even though none of these materials will ever go on display in the public exhibits, even for uh, field staff. They are closed behind these sheets and field staff, unless they have to get permission from the tribe in order to access them, which they regularly do. But not only that, but that the Hopi did instead put a feather there to mark the significance and sacred space here, that that feather, which has not been accessioned, which has not been included in the collection of the Hopi tribe, is allowed to abide as a prayer to the materials there. It is a Hopi normative commitment. It is a statement of Hopi jurisdiction downstairs in the field, and it is left there to abide as an ordering principle of the collection and not as an object collected. Oh, come on. Is it going to show me? Yes. OK. I finally want to end with this. You all are implicated in this. Because another thing I wanted to tell you about was this amazing ritual screen that I encountered at Hopi and its implications for its significance for how Hopi people understand their commitments to their material culture and what it means. I wanted to show it to you for various reasons, uh, but I needed to get permission first from the from the Field Museum, and I knew that I needed to get permission not only from the Field Museum, but eventually I was going to have to get permission from the tribe itself. And the Field Museum deferred to the tribe. The Field Museum, in essence, said, with perhaps only one or two ex uh, exceptions, the director of the CPO, his decision as to whether you can show or not show images, which have been published and you can access quite widely, though I'm not going to tell you where, uh, that Lee's perspective will trump mine, we would defer to him. And in fact, they have. And in fact, the director said, no, you can't show it. 
And so in some ways, by my standing here and telling you the story of how this was foreclosed and kept shrouded, this ritual screen was screened off from you, you and I are enacting, and I've invited you along for this maybe unknowingly, to enact a kind of jurisdictional space in which Hopi norms are abiding. So in some ways we can say we have contributed to bringing to a certain extent, I'll be limited and I'll be not authoritatively because I'm not Hopi and I would never have claimed to be, uh, a kind of Hopi normative space because we have seen it, recognized it, and at least from my perspective, agreed to abide by it. Now you can choose to do what you will. So in that way, what I want to suggest is that this is all part of uh, a way in which the output, the, the, one of the unintended consequences of repatriation has involved opportunities for communication, cooperation, and collaboration that promise not just a chance to inventory items, not just a chance for these institutions, non-native, to find out what they hold, not just a chance for tribes to get back what they think they, what they believe was taken from them unfairly or illegally, and in many cases was, but to more proactively and from the get-go and going forward to engage mutually in kinds of opportunities for shared participation and management of the sort that creates a juris dictio, a speaking of law that enacts, a speaking of norms that enacts a kind of mutual authority and a space for recognizing that authority even off the Hopi mesas. Thank you very much. Thank you.